Can I get everybody's attention? <laughs> Welcome back, colleagues. It's so nice to see so many of you. I know the weather is in continuing to be hot. I don't know if you're here. You're escaping the air conditioning, into the air conditioning is probably the best approach, I think, on a day like today. So welcome back, everybody. I hope since we've last been in this space, you've managed to enjoy some lunch, some additional catch-ups with colleagues and friends, um, and um, the, our last pa um, set of parallel sessions. I think it's been fantastic to be part of lots of exciting and thought-provoking discussions on the role of innovative practice in enhancing the learner journey over the course of the last two days. And what can I say? There's still a bit more to come. <laughs> so we've got a final keynote and a final set of parallel sessions before we close our two-day event. And I am absolutely delighted to introduce our final keynote speaker, Dr. Steve Wheeler. Steve is a learning innovation consultant and former associate professor of learning technologies at Plymouth Institute of Education, where he cha chaired the Learning Futures Group and led the computing and science education teams from 1998 to 2017. Since 2019, Dr. Wheeler has held, held the position of tutor on the Masters of Education programme at Plymouth Margie University. He continues to research into technology-supported learning and distance education, with a particular emphasis on the pedagogy underlying, this, the, underlying the use of social media and Web 2.0 technologies. He has given keynote, keynotes to audiences in more than 35 countries and is the author of over 150 scholarly articles with more than 10,000 citations. An active and prolific edgy blogger, his blog, Learning With Ease, is a regular online commentary on the social and cultural impact of disruptive technologies and the application of digital media in education, learning and development. He is also a senior fellow of the European Distance and E-Learning Network. In his keynote, titled Pedagogy Over Technology, Learning Technology Futures, Dr. Wheeler will trace the development of education technology, its key milestones, developments and debates, drawing on practical examples of the use of technology to support innovative education, learning and development. Steve will explore several emerging trends in ed tech before challenging us all to consider the relationship between pedagogy and learning technology. So can I please ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Wheeler. Well done, Carol, for getting through that. <laughs> Quite a marathon, wasn't it? Good afternoon. Nice to see you all. It's great to be here in Scotland. Actually, at my age, to be honest, it's great to be anywhere. But uh, I think at midnight tonight, I turn into a pensioner. So it's my birthday tomorrow, and I'll be I'll put my teeth in 66 tomorrow. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, officially a pensioner. It's, um, I think this is... I was working it out three and a half years since my last in-person keynote speech. The last one I did was in December 2019 in Online Educa Berlin. Anyone been there to that one? So that was three and a half years ago. And now, three and a half years later, I'm flying into a foreign country again. That, well, I've got a few laughs anyway. But that, <laughs> that's a few more. Well, I'm on a roll. But the thing is... Um, I'm actually not a stranger to Scotland because uh, what most people don't know is I'm actually a product of the education system of Scotland. I lived in the most northerly part of Scotland for two years. Anyone guess where that is? Any geographers? Where? Unst. Very nearly. Yeah, Shetland. That's right. I, I, I lived for two years in a croft in, in, in the, in the, in, outside the, the town of Lerwick um, overlooking a, a Pictishbroch called Musa. And um, so I know a lot about 
the, 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 the Shetland culture, I think. It's quite, it's quite an amazing place. And um, so if anyone calls me a soft southerner, you're in for a punch-up, all right? Just, just warn you for that, all right? Hello to all those who are watching online, by the way, and don't misbehave yourself because we can see what you're doing, all right? But um, anyway, so here's my clicker. I'm going to start off by showing you this slide here, which is, is the title of the talk. And what I want to do today is go very quickly through a whole load of different ideas and concepts and theories related to learning technology, because it's a very fast-moving field. I mean, we've, I've heard you in conversations in the last two days talking about AI, for instance, and virtual reality. These are just two of the, I suppose, the multi-pronged thrust of, of technology that's happening in education at the moment, and that will influence us in the future. There's a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of, I suppose, anxiety and worry about um, these new technologies. But I'm here to, to kind of give you a, an overview of all of it and to see where we're going. I'll probably raise more questions than I'll give you answers, by the way. All right, but just, just so you know. So who are we dealing with? Well, students today, the students coming into our universities today were born in this century, largely. And most of us were born in the last century. Interesting, isn't it? There's, a, there's a, a dichotomy for you. Someone once said the average digital birth of children when they first start appearing online is around six months. I refute that because um, they're now appearing before they're born. And uh, children today are growing up in a technology-immersed world, which some of us, people my age, and people even 30-plus, didn't experience. So we've got this interesting... Not divide exactly, but kind of overlap that's going on. And there's this idea that there are digital immigrants and digital natives. Have you heard this expression? It's a whole load of cobblers. Can I use the word cobblers? I can't, yeah. It's a whole load of cobblers um, because uh, Prensky's idea that Digital natives are the younger ones who know how to use technology and they do it like a duck to water. And the older ones like me struggle with it. We can learn technology, but we speak it with an accent. There's that kind of idea out there. And that leads to all sorts of excuses. Well, I'm not going to get involved in technology because my students know how to do this better than me. Actually, there's a much better theory. Um, Dave White and Alison Laconia in Oxford University came up with this theory back in 2011. And they talk about digital residents and visitors. Now, a digital resident is somebody who habituates into a particular type of technology and becomes very familiar with it to the point where they don't need to think about it anymore. And someone who is, an, who is a visitor uses it casually and maybe they struggle with it and they have to keep asking their colleagues, you know, how do I do this? It's about context rather than age. And I think that's important for us to think about as we go through this presentation. So my colleagues... Often, when I talk to them, they ask these questions, you know, how do I make it work? How do I avoid looking like an idiot? Um, they'll know more about this than I will. Come on, who identifies with that? Come on, admit it. Quite a few people, but hands are going up. What do students think about? The younger ones. They think about that. That's their worry. <laughs> it's more practical, isn't it? Yeah, and the thing is... Um, yeah, you probably know what's coming. I tell you, this is no word of a lie. A couple of my young students came into my office about, what, five or six years ago when I was still at Plymouth University, and they said, Steve, do you happen to have one of those floppy disk things? I said, what do you want one for? They said, we're doing a history lesson. <laughs> and I said, well, why are you asking me? You know, well, because we thought, we thought you might have some, and I actually did have some, <laughs> um, which was much to my shame. But if you actually throw, show that to a... Um, a, a teenage kid today, they'll go, oh, something like, oh, you just, cool, you just 3D printed this save icon. It'll be something like that because they don't actually know what these technologies are. It's very quickly outmoded. Technologies very quickly go out of date and new ones come in to replace them or are built upon them. And that's the story of technology. And we've got to just get used to that because change is inevitable, except from a vending machine. Yeah, so the thing is, this is about education. Sorry for any Welsh people in the audience, but this is um, pointing to education. Illiterate in two languages. And often, 
we've got this huge uh, gulf in between understanding and, and knowledge. And we see this kind of mistake happening all over the place. It's not just on the roads. It's, that's more or less permanent, of course. They had to spend a lot of money to repair that. But the problem we've got is that we're kind of immersed in our own culture, our own time. We are victims of our, of our own time. And you take this picture by Vilma, who was, who was actually um, an artist back in the 1900s. In 1910, he actually created this image. He did a whole series of them. And this is supposed to be what education would look like in the year 2000, 90 years hence. Can you see what he's done there? It's interesting, isn't it? He's not so far wrong, actually, because that could be known as network learning. But what's actually happening there is it's still very didactic. You've got the teacher as the, the owner of the means of production, as Marx would say. He's pouring in knowledge into their heads. And they're all sat in rows, like you're doing now. Ironic, isn't it? When, in fact, the last thing we want to do, really, is sit in rows to learn. So we're a product of that. What we need is disruptive pedagogy. I'm going to talk more about pedagogies than I am technology today, I think you'll be pleased to know, because technology is fine, but it's the pedagogy that matters the most. The teaching and learning is enhanced by the technology, not driven by it. That's going to be my argument. And come back on me on that, if you like. Any technologists in the audience? But um, you see, the thing is, I mean, even Voltaire said this, Every man or woman is a creature of the age in which he lives, and few are able to rise themselves above the ideas of the time. It takes a visionary to actually step beyond that and say, okay, this is what the future is really going to be like because I'm creating it now. You might have students that will do that. Who knows? But imagine this. Okay, the telephone was invented a long, long time back by Alexander Graham Bell. Well, he, own, he owns the patent anyway on it. There were other inventors as well at the time, but uh, they, they didn't have as good lawyers. But the thing is, um, when he invented the telephone, he said this. One day, every town in America will have a telephone. He was right. Who's been to America? <laughs> every town has a telephone, doesn't it? What he couldn't foresee was the idea that everyone would have one in their pockets. Um, that's the first mobile phone, very big. They were actually... Sorry, that's the wrong photograph. But, uh, but uh, the, the idea that we've all got these mobile phones now, the idea that we've got something that we can use to surf the internet with, we can use it to communicate with, we can use it to create, we can use it to share, we can use it to identify ourselves with. There's a whole range of things that we do with our mobile phones now which were un unforeseeable because it was so far out of our idea of the time. Um, I'll give you a bit of a history here. This is a building called the Evoluon. It was in Eindhoven in 1970 that I went on a school trip. I was living in Holland at the time. My dad was a member of the Royal Air Force, and he was uh, uh, stationed in a NATO base. And I went to uh, this building in 1970, and it was shaped like a flying saucer. There were about five levels. You went up in a glass lift, and you started at the top and worked your way down. It was the whole history of technology from from the, the, the discovery of fire all the way down through to whatever the technology was at the time. And I walked into one room, and there was a camera and a TV set and a microphone in there. And one of my friends walked into another room, and it had the same setup. And we video conferenced with each other. This was incredibly new at the time. Now you can do it on FaceTime in your hand. But at the time, it took all that equipment to do it with. And Star Trek had just come out, and we, we were really kind of enamored with this. This actually led me on the road to a complete entire career in learning technology, as it's now called. And we used to use these kind of things. He's an interesting chap, isn't he? He looks really enthralled. Um, these black and white television cameras, which we carried around on our shoulders, and we had a battery belt weighed us down. If we'd have fallen into the water, we wouldn't have survived. But these things were just, that was technology of the day. And remember these, the open real panda machines, spirit duplicators. One whiff of that, and you were away with the fairies, I tell you. Um, Bell and Hell, 16 millimeters. <laughs> remember the VHS and the Betamax. Some people are going, yeah, I've still got one. <laughs> but um, then came the idea of computers as well, and, and they were massive, these things. They, they were right from the 
Colossus days all the way up through to what we've got now, the, the technology has just um, got faster and faster, smaller and smaller, and more and more uh, user-friendly. Uh, some more ideas here, around about the 80s. Interestingly, in 1964, a guy called Joseph Weizenbaum invented a, um, a computer program called ELISA. Anyone heard of it? It was one of the first dialogic computer programs, and you could actually ask it questions, and it would respond to you. And he discovered that there's this idea of personification. When you use technology and it looks intelligent, you ascribe human a kind of um, uh, characteristics to it. And then you start shouting at it, you stupid computer, what are you doing to me? You know, computer says no. That kind of stuff. It's all, it's all kind of personification. And this was one of the earliest forms of artificial intelligence. It's not new. Back in 82, I, started to, uh, I found the base code for ELISA, and I took it, and I reprogrammed it. And I wrote a program called Dr. Fraud. And I was training psychiatric nurses at the time, so we were training them how to you know, deal with abuse from patients. And so um, I programmed it to insult them, to swear at them, and to tw twist what they were saying and to throw it back at them. You know, they queued up to, to be insulted by this machine. And they would, you did hear gales of laughter, you know, oh, it's just told me this, you know. Um, the thing is, it's fascinating to us to think that a machine could actually think. In fact, all it's doing is it's responding blindly to instructions. But we'll come back to that. You still with me? Okay. Bit of a watershed moment around about the 1990s. Tim Berners-Lee invented what we now know as the World Wide Web. The internet was already there. It had been there since the early 50s with ARPANET and the American um, government's uh, uh, networks. But he invented a, a, a friendly version of it, which allowed us to, to go in and actually inquire on everything within, as it was called. And that's the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics. This is for everyone. And then we move forward again to about, what, I suppose 13 years ago, the in, an introduction of the iPhone. So we had our first touchscreens. This was space age stuff at the time, wasn't it? I've still got one of the first iPhones. It's tiny, it's about so big. And um, they were very expensive. The age of um, gestural computing on the right there and also satellite communications just advanced beyond recognition. And then we started seeing the idea that we could play games with these things and, and, and go into virtual worlds with these things. And around about the 80s, I would, I would suggest to you, um, technology stopped becoming educational technology and started to become learning technology because it was at that point that we started to see personal use of it. I used to see my nurse, uh, nurse students um, sit in front of computers and learn on their own, learn um, with what we called programmed learning at the time, um, later became computer-assisted learning, and they would work their way through a program at their own pace, in their own time, and in their own way of learning, and at the end of it, they'd have an understanding, they'd be tested on it, and they'd get a printout to, to accredit them. And that was very, very early computer-based stuff. Um, but here's the, here's the thing. Everything, when it's designed, has an affordance. This comes from the work of J.J. Gibson, psychologist who talked about the idea that when you look at something, the intelligent design that's been built into it tells you what you can do with it. So this door handle here, for instance, has a left-handed affordance. Do you see? On the other side, it'd be right-handed, but you've got to open it with the left hand here and twist and pull or push. So that's the affordance of that. Um, and one of the things that we need to think about when we're designing learning spaces with technology is what is the affordance or the affordances we're building into it to allow students to do it with. So this... Here is a typical situation that you see in lots of universities, even now, up and down the country. People you know, sitting in tears. Not, not tears, but maybe sometimes, depending on the lecturer, but certainly in rows and, and right to the back, and you see some of them maybe falling asleep and, and, and so on. Um, that is the affordance that's been built into it. Look, look underneath your chairs. Where's the nearest power socket to plug your laptop in when you're running out of juice. Isn't there one? Oh, that's a surprise. 
Um, how do you turn around and collaborate with people behind you when you're in rows like this? You don't. Right, that's the surprise, isn't it? Um, 2023, learning design of spaces, design of learning spaces, and we're still not savvy enough to understand that students now need power and they, they, they need to turn around and work with each other, they need to move around the room and so on. So there are certain things that we're doing. Some of my students a few years ago, um, we built in power sockets underneath and they were able to create personal windows on the world. Every time the lecturer said something, they would Google it. They'd find out what, a little bit more about it, go, go drill deeper. And um, th there's, there's this idea, I mean, Derek Bruff talks about this, the American um, psychologist talks about this being the most important flexible learning tool ever. <laughs> this is technology we're talking about here. This is not furniture anymore. This is now an enabling technology. Um, turn and learn. I think this is Sheffield Hallam. I, I, I was a PhD examiner there a couple of years back, about five years ago, and, and um, I noticed in one of their laboratories or one of their um, lecture theatres that you, you can turn the chairs. These are affordances that tell students what they can do with that room, with that space. Um, here's another one. This is from the um, University of North Carolina. Sorry, North, yeah, it is North Carolina in the US. Um, Technology-enhanced learning spaces. Technology-enhanced active learning spaces where the students take control of their environment and they dictate the pace at which they're learning. They decide how they're going to learn and where they're going to learn within that space or even outside of it. Yeah, team-based problem solving. These are powerful ideas. If you've never tried it, have a go, have a look at it and see what it involves. I've tried it myself with, with, with teams, you know, go, 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 you know, giving them problems to solve, uh, particularly ill-structured problems where they don't have all the parameters and then they have to make up the rest themselves. The amount of learning that takes place through those kind of uh, approaches to pedagogy is absolutely amazing, mind-blowing stuff. And um, obviously, we go into hybrid now. Um, at the height of the pandemic, my phone was ringing off the hook. Steve, come and help us. We need somebody who knows a bit about how to create hybrid spaces. And these were the same people who a few years ago had been dissing me and saying, oh, you'll, it'll never happen. You know, and, you know, I didn't say I told you so, but I told them so. Um, that this is coming and it's now with us. A combination of technology. And, and here's a problem for you to think about. William Gibson, the Canadian science fiction writer, said, the future's here, but it's not evenly distributed. So you've got a socioeconomic divide. There are still students who don't have technology, who don't have Wi-Fi access at home, who maybe don't even have... The, the, um, the wherewithal to, to buy that technology. What do you do for them to enhance their learning? So that we call that um, the haves and have-nots. Then there's the cans and can-nots, the kind of the skills divide, where some students haven't got the ability or they don't have the knowledge to be able to use those technologies and leverage them for their own learning. And then, of course, you've got the wills and will-nots. Have you heard of technophobia? Uh, there's still a lot of it about. People are still worried about using technology. Um, I'll let you read this. So there are these divides that we have to be concerned with when we're talking about technology and education. The digital divides, all of them, they still exist. Here's an interesting idea for you, and I'll tell you a, a quick story, and um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the time. So we've got enough time to talk about all these ideas at the end. Can you imagine um, a university that was brand new being built? And the governors and the stakeholders of the university, they went to a well-known architect, and they said to him, okay, this is what we need. We need so many buildings. We need um, this and this and this. We need laboratories. We need this kind of um, design and so on. But what can you come up with? And he came up with a big blueprint for them. And uh, they looked at it and they said, yeah, but um, where are all the pathways between the buildings? He said, wait. Said, oh, right, OK, you know what you're doing. So they, they started constructing all these buildings, great big building site. 
And as they were topping it out and finishing it off and commissioning it, the governors and the stakeholders came back to the architect and said, where are the pathways? You said you'd put them in. He said, I told you to wait. They said, but the staff and the students are all appearing. They're going to be here next week. He said, wait. And so what happened was all the staff and all the students came along and they started walking in between the buildings and creating their own little pathways. Interesting. Then he came in when those pathways were defined enough and he paved them over. You've got user experience, you've got design. There's two different things. So what I'm saying to you is with the best will in the world, you can design what you want for your students but if you don't consult with them, they'll subvert it and they'll go the way they want to go. When Facebook first came in, do you remember that? Facebook started to take off in the UK and um, all the students started to adopt it. And I, I got several of my um, um, colleagues, in fact, they were senior colleagues, they called me in and said, Steve, look, you're, you're a technology expert. What can we do to stop students using Facebook? That was what they asked me. I, I said, what do you mean? What do you want to, why do you want to stop them? Well, because it's disruptive. They'll be doing all sorts of stuff under the table. I said, well, firstly, you're not going to be able to stop them. And secondly, how do you know that they're going to be doing stuff under the table? That, you know, why are you so suspicious of your students? Don't you trust them to actually use these technologies appropriately? There will be consequences if they don't, but most of them will probably use it appropriately. And I said to them, the thing is, you're spending all these millions of pounds on virtual learning environments and you're developing all these tools, collaborative online tools, and you're putting all these bulletin boards into place. I said, but the thing is, they'll go to that when they need to and they'll go to Facebook when they want to because that's where their friends are. And that's the difference between user experience and design. So... Consultation with your students is vitally important if you want, if you're interested in quality. And I think you all know this already. I'm preaching to the choir, aren't I? But let's get on to some of the, um, the divisive stuff now. You've all heard about artificial intelligence, and you could all probably name me several of the AI models that are around today. And you could all tell me what the latest news articles are. Currently, two of the godfathers of, or the grandfathers of AI are out falling out with each other. Jeffrey Hinton's resigned and said, this is going to be the disaster of humanity. Chat GPT will take over the world. And you get um, Professor Lacan, who's actually still at Google, saying, actually, no, it's a whole load of rubbish. We are, the, we are in charge of what we do with that technology. We are the ones who will actually make it work for us, not the other way around. And there are three types of, of, of artificial intelligence. There's the, the machine learning type, which is stage one, which we're in at the moment, which we would call narrow artificial intelligence. And yeah, certainly take photographs of it, but these slides will be available at the end. So the narrow artificial intelligence is where the technology is starting to catch up and starting to become something that's significant. And I would suggest to you that actually... Um, Chat GPT is just about on that border there at the moment, along with other, you know, whatever you want to call it, DAL E, for instance, and BARD, and all these other technologies that you've got. And the idea of them going into a machine intelligence where it's actually a general artificial intelligence, where the computer begins to match us across the whole board of our skills and our knowledge, um, it first has to pass what we call the Turing test. And most of you know what that is, but if you don't, I'll elaborate the Turing test. Alan Turing, who was a computer scientist back in the 40s and 50s, helped uh, Bletchley Park to break the Enigma code. He actually came up with the idea that if a computer is to imitate a human being to an extent where you cannot tell the difference between the computer and a human being, then that's the Turing test passed. And I put it to you that that hasn't happened yet. And I'll give you some examples if you press me on it, but I'm going to move on, okay? The Turing test has to be passed and I would suggest that all of the current AI that we know, not just Siri, Alexa, Cortina, and all, Cortina and all the others, ChatGPT, they're all sat over here on this side of the line. They haven't yet bridged that line across into artificial general intelligence. What happens when it becomes machine intelligence is going to be quite rapid. 
At that point, we're going to reach the point where uh, what Ray Kurzweil calls the singularity, where computers become super intelligent and they start to surpass our knowledge and surpass our understanding and our skills in just about every area. And again, if you're in the know in AI, you know that that's a long, long way off at the moment. I say at the moment. But even if, even if it happens, we're not going to be in a Terminator situation. This is, this is, I'm, I'm going into my own opinion now on this, but having studied it for several years, I don't think we will ever get to that position because there'll be so many checks and balances put into place by both governments and by scientists that I don't think we'll ever have that situation where the computers will start to control us. Now, some of you are looking doubtful. This is the contentious bit. And I'm going to move on and show you some of the things that we can actually do currently with chat GPT and various other AI models. This comes from the work of um, Mike Sharples, who, uh, as you know, is Professor Emeritus at the OU, uh, an old friend of mine. I, 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 you probably can't read these, but have a look at them later on when you, um, when you get the full slide set, if you want it. I'll just go through some of them for you. It can act like a personal tutor. It won't replace teachers or tutors, but it will act like one when the tutor isn't available or if the tutor has too many students to deal with. So it can, um, it can give immediate feedback on the student's progress. It provides personalized feedback to the student, which is interesting, because we talk about personalized learning. How are we going to achieve that with 180 students in the room? Here's one way of doing it. There was a, a, a science fiction writer called Arthur C. Clarke. Do you remember him? Uh, he used to live in Sri Lanka. He, he, he wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey, for instance, or the film that came from the book, and various other wonderful science fiction books. And uh, I remember, um, I think it was uh, Sugata Mitra, another old friend of mine, an Indian professor, who actually went and met him. And w way back in the early days, around about the 80s, he said to him, um, do you think, um, Mr. Clark, that computers will one day replace teachers? And... Uh, Clark actually responded and said, actually, any teacher who can be replaced by a computer should be. <laughs> because when you think about it, a computer is not a teacher. A computer is a, a, a blind set of instructions. When we talk about teaching, we talk about a whole skill set which involves creativity and a whole lot of intelligent interpretation of people's body movement and, 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 and um, nonverbal skills and all sorts of other stuff. It's a fine, nuanced set of skills. And here, here's the rub. Computers cannot break rules. They have to follow instructions. They cannot break those instructions. They have to blindly follow those rules and churn out what is at the end of it. A human teacher can break the rules anytime they want. That's the huge difference to me between machine intelligence and human intelligence. And that means that you'd better darn well start thinking about all your creative skills and, and how you're going to capitalize on those to keep one step ahead of these computer tools. Um, there, there are so many other ideas that Mike's come up with here. Um, Motivator, AI offers games and challenges to extend learning. Um, a dynamic assessor, it, it provides educators with a profile of each student's current knowledge. Big data coming out of it, which can help you personalize your assessment to them as well. There's so many um, new ideas coming out, and I'm sure people in the room have got ideas as well that aren't on this list about how you can leverage the power of, um, of AI models like ChatGPT. But it's about pedagogy, remember. It's about leveraging this technology. It's not about letting the technology take over. It's about providing new ways of teaching and learning through the technology. Think of it as an accelerator pedal. The pedagogy is the driver, and the technology is an accelerator pedal. Think of it that way. It's a fairly good analogy, actually. So the trends that I see happening with technology is that Education is becoming much more learner-led than it was in the past because students have now got these new technologies in their hands 
and they can Google things. They can do all sorts of other stuff. Um, here's an example uh, of one of the things that I set up. I know a lot of academics hate Wikipedia because it's user-generated content and it's fraught with problems. But I said to one of my groups once, okay, I want you to use Wikipedia in, in this lesson. What I want you to do is find a piece of knowledge, find a gap, and then write about it on the appropriate Wikipedia page and see how long you can keep it up there for before it gets taken down. Oh, well, we're up for that. And they all dived into it. They were so enthusiastic. And some of them did manage to find new stuff to add to particular pages. Most of them just got taken down within minutes because the Wikipedia police are vicious. Um, but um, there's, that, there's ideas that you can use these kind of technologies, even if they're frowned upon, you can use them and leverage the power of them, the affordances of them to actually create new um, opportunities for your students. Um, here's one. Have you heard of ungoogleable questions? Well, you have now. Um, the thing is, uh, I was down in New Zealand working with a, a university down there. Um, I was on a two-week residential. Um, universities hire me occasionally to go in and um, solve their pedagogy problems, their curriculum issues and their assessment issues and so on. And uh, I was working with one group of um, paramedic um, colleagues, and they were anatomy and physiology specialists. And I said, so what's your problem then? They said, well, we've got a, you know, a whole load of groups of students, and um, we go in and we give them all sorts of knowledge on, AR, uh, on, um, on uh, A&P, you know, anatomy and physiology, and they just Google it all. You ask them questions, they just Google it all and find the answers. I said, well, have you thought of an ungoogleable question? And they said, well, is there one? I said, there's loads. And I was kind of thinking fast on my feet here at this point. So I said, right, OK, anatomy and physiology. Are there, by any, any chance, any biologists in the room? I'd, I'd just like to know. Yeah, you'll, you'll like this one. And you might be able to answer the question. I don't know. Um, any others? A and, R, a and P specialists? Yeah, great. OK, there we go. So this is a challenge for you, you two and anyone else who's, who's an AMP specialist. So I said, so an ungoogleable question around AMP. And there were 15 of these people in the room, and they were national experts in New Zealand on AMP. I said, what is there exactly five of in the normal human body? Any idea? What is there exactly five of in the normal human body? And now someone's going to start Googling it. Because that's what they did. Because they couldn't answer it. They said, it can't be fingers. I said, no, because there's eight. Ten if you count your thumb. They said, five senses? I said, well, there's actually 33. Um, five lumbar vertebrae. Have you thought of that one? I said, that's artificial, because there's more than five vertebrae in the body. And they gave up in the end, and they were getting quite angry at me at that point. And I said, so, uh, do you know the answer? Nope, there's, there's, there's actually 12 of those, 12 cranial nerves. And I can name them all for you with a very rude rhyme later on, all right? When, when we're... <laughs> Anyone else? What is there exactly five of? Got you all stumped, hasn't it? And yet you're all, you know, you're all academics or members of your... And see, this is a gateway question. The answer, you're going to kick yourself... The answer, five lobes of the lung. Yeah? Three one side, two the other. Remember? Got it? Three one side, two the other. Because the heart is slightly inclined to the left. It pushes them out of the way. So we've evolved with three lobes on one side and two on the other. And then we're going, oh, that's... I said, but, but hang on a sec. That's a gateway question. Now you've got to ask, okay, why is the heart slightly inclined to the left? And then we're going, ah, got it. And so they then started, I said, you can go off and you can find other ungoogleable questions in any field you want and just pose those to the students. It will stump them and they'll have to work hard because, remember, learning is in the struggle. Learning is in the struggle. If you don't work hard for something, you're not going to remember it. What we've got to have um, is not this kind of stuff. Do you know what this is? Shout it out if you know it. The Mandelbrot set, exactly. It's a fractal. It's a recessive um, kind of formula which creates itself 
ad infinitum, and you can drill down. You can see these on, on, um, on the web. You can just drill through them, and it'll just go straight down. It'll keep repeating itself and keep growing and growing, and just keep repeating and repeating itself. And for years in education, especially in higher education, what we've been doing is just re reproducing knowledge. What goes from my head goes into your head. And now go away and try and make sense of it. I know that there are innovative processes going on in university where clearly we're, we're, we're becoming a lot more than just recessive educators. Um, what we need to, go, to do is, is go from recursive to discursive. We need to branch out instead. We need to start asking questions which promote more questions and then ungoogleable questions or whatever it is we, we come up with as, as, as our, our, our approach to, to pedagogy to put students in a different direction than we ourselves went in. Remember, we were born in the last century, a lot of us. They were born in this century, and therefore, we can't possibly fall back on the stuff that we were taught, the way we were taught it. We've got to move on from there, I think. So I'll give you an example. Have you seen this one before? This is a maths example. And the teacher... This is, this is a, a, a kind of recursive idea that's going on here. The teacher says, okay, here, here's, the, here's the, um, the formula. And, of course, it ends in infinity, doesn't it? So you might know what's coming next here. But this is an actual example of the student's workings out. So she gave her a different example, and the student came up with this result. That's what happens when you have recursive education. It's got to be discursive. It's got to move away from that. We've got to, we've got to break the boundaries and continually break the boundaries because education can't stand still. Technology isn't standing still. We don't want technology to drive the education. We want it to be the other way around. Um, so we're also seeing things going towards digital now. Um, analog's virtually dead in many ways. Um, and from closed to open as well. There's so many trends going on. Tethered to mobile, I, I saw this outside my university, just up down the road, and I thought, I'll take a picture of that. I came back two days later, and it was gone. They'd removed it, like they're doing all over the country, all over the world. Back to the first mobile phone again. I, I thought I'd show you that because it, it just is such a, a funny idea that mobile phones used to be so big. We, the, the brick became the little SIM card which you carry now, and the rest of it is just there to make the affordance happen around that communication tool. Laptops, from mobile to personal to social, I think these are going to be the three major trends that you're going to see in um, higher education in the next few years. Uh, rapidly, we're going to see much more mobile learning. We're going to see a lot more personalized and personal learning. There is a difference. And we're also going to see a lot more social, socially rich, um, engagement with learning. How am I doing for time? I've showed you this before, but we need to move from standardized to personalized. Uh, we also need to move from isolated to connected. Even when students are, like you heard from the Open University guys earlier on, they may be dispersed, but they can still connect. Because we like to connect. Would you rather be here in the room, or would you rather be at home watching online? How do online people? Just ignore that question. Would you rather be here or would you rather be at home? You'd rather be here. Why? Because it's richly social and you learn a whole lot more, don't you, by sitting over a coffee with people and talking and talking about the, comparing and contrasting what you do and who you are and where you come from and so on. So there's a whole load of stuff around that. Personal connections can be created through um, technology, of course. So this guy here, he might be connected to three people, but those people, it's not sure. And this is what social media still does today. It doesn't matter what social media you're subscribing to, that's what it does. <coughs> I'll give you an example. Um, some of my sessions with my undergrads, especially my second years, they were all on Twitter at the time. That was the, the uh, a la mode for them. And I'd have two screens in my room, and I'd have a, a screen for my slides, and I'd have another, another screen, which was a live Twitter wall. And this is a true story. Um, 
I'd, subscri I'd ascribe um, a hash code, a hashtag, to each seminar that we did or each le lecture that we did. You can imagine 50 or 60 students in the room and they all know the hash code. And it's only that hash code, that hashtag, that actually appears on the Twitter wall. So anything that's said under that hash code, that hashtag, appears in, in a sequence. And they use that to actually ask questions, to um, compare notes with each other, to share resources, to do a whole range of things. And I happen to be talking about a book by a particular acad academic colleague in America that I, I knew personally. And one of the students asked a question about it. And so I copied him in on the screen. And about 20 minutes later, he answered. The students were... And within a short time, everything had gone quiet, and they were all murmuring in the background. And they said, is that... I said, yes, it is. It's who you think it is. And so they had a conversation with the academic himself. We broke down the walls of that classroom through Twitter. And they were talking about that for days because they really had to read that book then and find out what this guy was on about. Inspirational stuff. Um, crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing. The idea of connectivism, where, where, you, where you use the technology to connect together. You know, George Seaman, Stephen Downs, who came up with the idea of MOOCs back in um, the first, first part of this century, around right about 2004. Um, the idea that you, when you connect with people, there's a whole load more that you can do with each other than when you're not connected with each other. Um, this idea here came about um, several years ago with an American colleague, a friend of mine. Um, we decided to send each other an image, a blog image, or a, we call it a blimage, blog image. And um, I sent her an image, and she wrote a blog about it and how it related to her learning. And she sent one back to me, and I wrote a blog about how it related to my learning. Other people joined in, and before long, there were literally hundreds of people around the world in, I don't know how many, 50-odd countries, all using the hashtag Blimage and sending each other pictures and, and, and writing blog posts about that, what that meant to their learning. And sometimes those images could be quite challenging. You had to think of a connection between that and your learning. That was the challenge. And then you had to go away and do some research on it. And it became quite a trend for about three or four weeks uh, in the summer of, I think it was 20, 2014. Um, so these kind of things are just leveraging the power of technology to make people connect together and learn together. Because learning's changing. It's becoming more um, productive. Students are producing their own content now. I mean, these are kids I know, but students produce their own content. They say, give a child a camera and watch him become creative. But the thing is, they, they produce. They don't only consume and remix. And what's that one over there? That one is share. But they also produce. And they do it a lot. Whether you know about it or not, they do it. Um, we learn by doing. We learn by creating. Here's three of my students from a few years back. And I said to them, go away and study the Zone of Proximal Development by uh, Leventy Vygotsky as a theory. So what did they do? They created a stop-go animation on the Zone of Proximal Development. And they did it there in the classroom. It took them an hour. They're primary school teachers. It's going to be transferable skills later on when they go in the classroom. It's endless, the amount of stuff that you can do with a bit of technology and a bit of an idea around what you want to do with that technology through the pedagogy. Students taking notes. We know this happens. Actually, interesting, some of, my, some of my colleagues said to me, that's not learning, Steve. I said, I know it's not, but it's a gateway into learning. Because what do they do next with the image? They go away, they reflect on it. They maybe share it with each other. They maybe discuss it. They maybe write a blog post about it. Maybe they'll do a video on it. Who knows? There's a whole load of stuff that can happen because of the image they've captured. Um, I know this is a bit out of date now, but I still think a lot of this is true, that students are much more self-directed now than they used to be in my years. When I was a student, um, they're more inclined to collaborate and work together, and they become the nodes of their own production. 
But I'm going to finish with this because I've gone on long enough. Um, the idea that actually students need, need something. They need, they need um, the right amount of literacy to be able to do this. Um, so I show my students this. <laughs> or, or, or this. I actually said this to a group of students. So I said, you know, what's wrong with that? And one of them said, oh, is it 70%? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. We need literacies. I'm not talking about skills or competencies now. There's a difference, all right? I'm talking about literacies. You see, the thing is, a skill is what you do. Let's give you an analogy. When you, when you learn to drive a car... You learn to drive on the left-hand side of the road. You sit on the right-hand side of the car. You follow the highway code. You do you stop, you know, stop at red lights and so on. You learn all of that. That's a, that's a, a skill. And eventually, when you drive to work and you don't even remember driving to work because you're very competent of it, that, that is obviously a competency. It's unconscious then. But you know, I, I was quite a competent driver. But when I went to work in America, everything's. Reversed. I was on the left-hand side of a car, and it wasn't even a gear shift car. It was actually a automatic, and I was on the right-hand side of the road, and all the signs were different. I had to learn the new culture. And I put it to you that actually, when you work in digital environments, you're, you're working in a different culture to what you're working in when you just work in analog. So you really need to learn the literacies. So here are some of them. I've got about nine there listed. And I just want to point out this one to you, and this is my final comment. Transliteracy, has anyone heard of this? Transliteracy is the ability to communicate effectively using whatever platform you desire to use. Blogging, wikis, YouTube, social media, TikTok, you know, podcasting, whatever. Transliteracy is the ultimate, it's I think the queen of all the literacies. And that's what we should be aiming all of our students at. And just to finish with, there we go. The mastery is, is where you get to the point where you have become that literate digitally that there's no challenge anymore for you with that and you can use it to leverage anything you want in terms of pedagogy. I won't go into all this because I'll leave this for another time. Um, knowledge that is acquired under... That's my son playing around with me. I asked him to find a picture of Socrates. That is Socrates. It's the wrong Socrates. Actually, it was Plato that said that. Knowledge that is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold on them. It's Plato that said it. So I'll find a picture of Plato for you. Damn it, that's Socrates. Um, got it. Right, there we are. There we are. That, that's perfect now. What you've just seen there is an example of the survival of the fittest comment, uh, <laughs> content. Darwickianism. Uh, <laughs> Just leave you with that, just a weird thought. Thank you for watching and listening. <laughs> and it's on time. I think we're going to have time for maybe one or two questions from the floor. I don't know if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask Steve. So I've got one down the front. Will I go down there? the talk it was really interesting um, but my question's about how to get um, lecturers and the universities uh, to understand that learning about these technologies and integrating them within teaching is valuable and is a good investment for example universities at the minute are saying we're not going to introduce new policies or new teaching or um, learning methods because it costs money to implement these and they'll be out of date really quickly that because of all the uh, interference. Um, it's about um, how, how do we convince our universities, how do we convince our, our, our professors, I guess, and our leaders to actually invest in this when, in fact, a lot of them are retreating from it, aren't they, you say? I, I think that's the case in some universities. I think in others they are pushing forward. Some universities are more advanced than others. I think you've got to win hearts and minds, and the only way you can do that is by modeling best practice. And that means you've got to find champions so find somebody who's doing something innovative and go and learn from them, and then let it spread. 
Um, that was the only way that I was able to do that in my university was by actually modeling it and, and pushing the boundaries out. I, I used to live stream my lectures on, online. And, and some of my colleagues went, this is dangerous stuff, Steve. You know, why? You know, why is it dangerous? Oh, because you're opening yourself up to all sorts of, you know. No, I'm not. Um, the students are actually enlivened by the idea that they're actually going to be they're able to watch it again later on. They've got the lecture capture, but they've also got the idea that it's live and there's people watching from outside the college coming in or the university coming in. So we've got to model best practice. We've got to push the boundaries. We've got to find the champions who will actually model that and actually convince the powers that be in every university that this is the best way forward. That's my only answer, really, because I've seen it done myself. We're going to take a question from um, our online delegate. So, Steph, can I hand over to you? Thanks, Caroline. Um, Phil asks, after a recent briefing on a large-scale ransomware attacks, how much effort should we, should we be placing on ensuring students have both digital and foundational skills stroke knowledge should our tech and connectivity be removed, even for a short period? Yeah, um, outages, um, malware attacks, um, denial of service attacks, all of this is part of everyday life now for any corporation or large organization. You're going to get it. It's going to happen regardless of how robust your system is. So you've got to have a plan B. And my wife was a classic example of this, actually. She was an English teacher. She's kind of um, virtually retired now herself. But she actually had a group of secondary students, and she was giving them a media study to do. And so she said to them all, um, Right, what I want you to do is go home tonight, and on the television, there's a certain program on BBC uh, Two at 8 o'clock tonight. I want you to make some notes on it and ask these questions about that program. And so they all did, yes, miss, and they all made notes of it, and that's what they all did. And then two of the girls came up to her at the end, twins, and they said, please, miss, um, our family, we don't have a television at home because for religious reasons, my mother and father don't want the television in the house. What do we do? So she had to devise an alternative for them. You've got to have a plan B. And it's the same with technology. Um, if technology fails, have a plan B. There's, there's always something else you can do that is just as good or even better, even if you don't have that technology available to you there and then. Um, but with the best world in the world, we'll, we'll never be able to predict these things. It's always going to happen. Colleagues, I get the impression we could possibly be here all afternoon, um, but we have to kind of wind up. So I'd like um, you all to join me in thanking Steve um, for his presentation today. Yeah. Yeah.